Welcome to Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. I'm absolutely thrilled uh, and really delighted to have uh, as our author today, Alfred Desaius, uh, who is one of the world's leading authorities on international law, on uh, human rights, on the United Nations, uh, on our hope, and this is the title of the book we'll discuss today, Our Hope for Building a Just World Order. Uh, Alfred, thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's really a, a great pleasure and especially a privilege to have a chance to discuss your important work um, and for people all over the world to understand what's at stake when we talk about uh, human rights, when we talk about international law, when we talk about the United Nations, and we talk when we talk about the concept of building a just world order. Now, this book, uh, which is a really, really important book, so I recommend that everybody get a copy and study it. It's, uh, it's something that you have to study at length uh, and, and in depth, uh, is a compendium of your remarkable work over many, many years, but especially uh, during a uh, period in which you were the UN independent expert for the Human Rights Council on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order. And if I may say, Alfred, that's quite an assignment. You were given an assignment by the UN system to give a, a, a charter on how to promote or how to create a democratic and equitable international order. I don't know if anyone ever before you actually had that assignment. Nope. The philosopher Immanuel Kant took on that assignment in a way, maybe the first one to do so systematically in 1795. But I don't know if anyone ever had your assignment to produce this remarkable compendium of ideas and discussions that range from peace, uh, military expenditures, the right of self-determination, the right to truth, many things that we'll talk about. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you come to get such an incredible assignment? Well, actually, I was the third on the short list. And it's actually <laughs> the U.S.'s fault <laughs> that I got All it. All right. How did that happen? <laughs> they knocked out the first two. There was such a campaign against the first two that it just, the uh, president of the council, Laura Dupuy, said, no, who's next? Zayas. Okay, I got it. And Imagine it was uh, such a surprise to me because uh, I'd been in the uh, council the day before. And there we are, 23rd of March, 2012. I'm so sure that I'm not getting it that I accepted an invitation from, from RT to uh, give an interview on Iran and the nuclear program. Would never have done that uh, if I thought I had a prayer and I come into the Human Rights Council in the afternoon, and everybody smiles at me, and I say, what the hell's going on? <laughs> I've still been appointed. So, uh, as the case may be, I took the ball and I ran with it. I mean, there's no more beautiful mandate. It's like being uh, named Secretary General, but without the responsibilities of the Secretary General and being able to brainstorm, being able to talk to everybody, including yourself and and, uh, and John Mersheimer and all of these greats whom I've always admired. And by the way, I'm also professor of international law and professor of history. I did my law at Harvard. I also did history at Harvard at the graduate school, but I got my doctorate in history from Göttingen in Germany. And uh, I've taught uh, both international law and um, history at various universities. And uh, one of the books that I always give to my students is this one. And uh, oh, you're from that thank one. You. All yep. right. <laughs> and uh, another one that I give to my students is this one. Okay, very good. So we're going to talk about uh, both of those. This one, our dear friend. Um, well, uh, 
The first one I put up was uh, Jeff's The End of Poverty. The second one is John Mersheimer's uh, The uh, Great Delusion. And the third one is uh, Jimmy Carter's Palestine Peace, Not Apartheid. Three excellent books. And uh, in any event, when I got the mandate in 2012, uh, I had to present a report already in September 2012. So my preliminary report basically was laying down the framework. This is what I intend to do. So I didn't do much of it uh, in the first report. Uh, but I, Alfred, before we get to that, let yeah. me uh, ask you to explain to everybody listening in, what is the Human Rights Council? How does it work? And why would they appoint a uh, an independent expert on, on a theme like this? Well, we have uh, a system, what's called special procedures of the Human Rights uh, Council. And that goes back actually to Theo van Boven and Kurt Herndl, uh, the earlier directors of the Division of Human Rights and the Center for Human Rights, which pre preceded the uh, Human Rights Council. Myself, um, I was hired by Theo van Boven in 1980, and I became the chief drafter for the United Nations Human Rights Committee, which is an expert body, 18 experts, most of them lawyers or judges, uh, who administer the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That, however, is not the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is the successor of the Commission on Human Rights. You may remember the first president of the uh, Commission on Human Rights was Eleanor Roosevelt, and the chief of the secretariat at the time was the great uh, Professor John Humphrey from McGill University in Canada. I love that man. He was fantastic. As the case may be, I had the honor to come in rather early into the system and made a career as a lawyer drafting for the Human Rights Committee for the Committee Against Torture, for the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discriminations, because they all had uh, a uh, petitions function. That is, as an individual, you could, after exhausting domestic remedies, go to the Human Rights Committee, and the committee would issue a judgment. And uh, that, of course, is a juridical process to be differentiated from the Commission on Human Rights and the Human Rights Council, which are largely political. And there's so if I could uh, just to, to clarify for myself to understand the, the history, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, of course, uh, um, remarkably led a commission to uh, draft and have adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And that, if I understand correctly, is really the basis of all that followed. Uh, it. Uh, is established the idea under the new United Nations, which had come into being in 1945, that human rights would be a core pillar of the uh, United Nations and of international law and the it's Universal the Declaration of Civilization. Of Civilization. What Thank you. See, what I want to see is the 21st century rediscover the spirituality of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is a very spiritual document. It's very solidly based on world religions and it's very solidly based on world philosophies. And unfortunately, we've been moving further and further away from that spirit of 1948. I mean, I have seen retrogression in uh, human rights and I've seen retrogression in respect for international law and international order. And that is what I tried to explain in 14 reports that I did for the General Assembly and for the Human Rights Council, and in uh, more than 100 press releases that I issued between 2012 and 2018. So is it right to say the Universal Declaration, 1948, gave rise to what became a growing body of law in which you are certainly one of the world's great authorities and practitioners, you helped to 
uh, implement that law during your period as a uh, senior lawyer for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And then uh, in 2006, the Human Rights Commission, which Eleanor Roosevelt had been the first chair, uh, became the Human Rights Council, an intergovernmental body of the United Nations to oversee human rights. And in 2012, in this surprise moment for you, you <laughs> became the independent expert of the Human Rights Council. But with this <laughs> incredible assignment, I mean, honestly, it uh, is uh, mouthwatering in how good it is. And, and that's why your book is so good and important. It is, you were asked, advise us on how the world should work to produce a democratic and equitable international order. Wow. Well, I, I certainly did my level best. And <laughs> already in 2013, I gave the General Assembly a taste of my ideas of reforming the United Nations uh, as an organization and also reforming the, Secretary, uh, the Security Council and phasing out step by step uh, the uh, uh, veto power, that's Article 27. Uh, well, I want to get to that specifically right. because uh, you start out as one of your earliest reports, uh, really a remarkable document, and I do compare it to Immanuel Kant's 1795 essay on perpetual peace, where the great German philosopher laid out the ideas of how an international system could work. I think other than uh, maybe the Hebrew prophets, the first one wow. to have such a broad vision, but also uh, su su I such, a yes, exactly, such a systematic vision that was based on the idea of international law, which barely existed after all. I mean, it didn't even exist when, when Kant had, had the idea. But now you are... Uh, writing about uh, a system that is taking shape. And I, I always feel, Alfred, and I'd like you know your view of it as you explain, we're in the early stages still of trying to make a system of international law. By my count, the formal attempt at a true international basis uh, was the League of Nations, very flawed during the high imperial period. So there was a, imperialism was the norm, not uh, the, the uh, discredited exception. Um, but we're only a hundred years into this effort yeah. to yeah. create a true system of international law. And what I loved is, I think it must have been your second report. It's the second chapter of this book. You lay out the principles of an international order. And I wonder if you could just take us through some of the main principles that you see as foundational for creating a decent world. Well, everybody knows that peace of Westphalia as being a foundation for the international law that developed after that, 1648. Their motto was Pax Optima Redum. Peace is the highest good. So, obviously, the first principles that So, are just for everybody, uh, background, end of the Thirty Years' War, 1648, devastation of uh, Europe uh, in uh, these bloody, often religious-based, sometimes not religious-based wars. Uh, the war ends with a Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, and peace is, after 30 years of mass bloodshed, the, the highest virtue. Eight million deaths and eight million in uh, the 17th wow. century was a lot. Wow. As the case may be, uh, the United Nations Charter, really the alpha and omega of the United Nations Charter is peace. We have three pillars. We have peace, development, and human rights. But peace is the enabler. You're not going to have development without peace. You're not going to have human rights without peace. So uh, it's clear that the 
purposes and principles of the United Nations enunciated in Articles 1 and 2 focus on that and focus on prevention of conflict. I mean, one of the most important articles, maybe more important than the prohibition of the use of force, is the article on dialogue. Article 2, paragraph 3, the obligation to settle all disputes by peaceful means. And the United Nations provides a forum. When I was a young man in Chicago, I was in high school in Chicago, October 1962, I had the, shall we say, the very great learning experience of watching uh, Adlai Stevenson, uh, Adlai Stevenson III, uh, debating uh, Valentin Zorin uh, on Dalit. And the, the, uh, the, the Soviet ambassador at the time. We were so close to Armageddon. We're so close to Apocalypse in 1962. And thank God for the existence of this forum known as the, the United Nations. And also the fact that we had a rational man in the White House. We had John F. Kennedy in the White House. And uh, he was not going to destroy the world over American hegemony or over the idea of uh, we don't allow anyone to put uh, missiles close to our border. Uh, he realized that he had a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the entire world, not only. It was not a matter just between the United States and, and the Soviet Union. Everybody was involved, and that is the same situation we're facing today again. As you know, I am a member of the Geneva International Peace Research Institute, and we do a lot of brainstorming on uh, peace matters, and we send them to uh, our Swiss president. I'm, by the way, I'm an American, but I'm also Swiss, uh, to uh, uh, Viola Anher, the president of Switzerland, to um, Ignacio Cassis, the foreign minister, et cetera, et cetera. I've drafted a... Um, uh, blue blueprint for peace in Ukraine, which is based very much on the United Nations Charter and on the, uh, shall we say, the supremacy course of the uh, co uh, clause of the UN Charter, which is Article 103. So the UN Charter trumps all other treaties, including the Treaty of the North Atlantic uh, uh, Treaty Organization. Uh, so NATO's uh, activities must conform to the United Nations Charter. So back to the 25 principles, I consider principle 10 to be very important, which is the principle uh, that the realization of self-determination is a conflict prevention strategy. Uh, you have to have early warning. You have to listen to grievances before they fester, before they uh, develop into a uh, violent outbreak. So that's why self-determination for the Palestinians, self-determination for the Kurds, self-determination for the Russians of Crimea, for the Russians of, of the Donbass. All of that could and should have been uh, the subject of referenda organized by the United Nations, monitored by the United Nations so that they would have legitimacy and credibility. But when, uh, after the coup d'etat in uh, Maidan uh, in uh, 2014, uh, when the new Putsch government uh, started adopting uh, really rapidly Russophobic legislation. Anti-Russian anti uh, legislation. Language. Again, that's why uh, self-determination. For me, the dispute uh, in uh, Ukraine has two sources. One is, of course, national security. You need an architecture uh, for all countries in Europe and in the world. And secondly, the self-determination 
of the people of Crimea on of Donbass. Only they should decide their fate. It's not for us to tell them that they belong here or there. Another principle, principle 15, uh, which is the principle of the right to your homeland, the right to your heritage, your history, your the right to memory. Uh, then, of course, I have a uh, an article on uh, Pacta Sunt Servanda, the obligation to observe treaties. I mean, uh, you will recall the Trump years, and we're likely to get another set of yep. Trump years, <laughs> but in any event, uh, you may recall how he just simply stepped out of all sorts of treaties. Again, uh, the international order can only function if everybody plays for the games. And uh, and one of the rules is Pacta Sunt Servanda, Article 26 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. But going back to my 25 principles, it's a compendium which uh, the then president of the General Assembly, uh, uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, called the Magna Carta for the 21st century. As uh -huh. a case may be, uh, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I mean, I am basing my principles on the UN Charter, on Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, on um, uh, the treaties that have em emerged since then. I mean, the uh, United Nations, the International Law Commission, uh, have done a phenomenal job of standard setting in all fields of human activity. Also, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Human Rights Council, you, I mean, out of this uh, Rooseveltian um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, we have uh, 10 core treaties that emerge uh, from that, besides all of the uh, declarations and all of the uh, um, uh, resolutions adopted, which are soft law. They are not treaties yet, but uh, they will be coming before the uh, 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 General Assembly for adoption in, in treaty form. There are several of these uh, declarations are now before uh, the General Assembly. And there's uh, one declaration that I particularly like, which was drafted at the time by Virginia Dan Dan from the Philippines. She was the rapporteur on international solidarity the right to international solidarity, that has been worked by uh, her successors and uh, is now ready, actually, for adoption. And the new um, Special Rapporteur on International Solidarity, Cecilia Beray uh, from Argentina, she has uh, sent it on uh, to the General Assembly. So there's things moving. I mean, uh, I must say, even though uh, there are problems, with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, problems of double standards, problems of selectivity. Uh, there are problems with the Human Rights Council. I'm very happy that we have them both. Huh? If we didn't have them, we would have to invent them. Uh, they are essential, but we want to strengthen them. We want to make sure uh, that there is transparency and accountability, and that is not always the case. So that is for well, the- Well, just, just to, I want to come back to your principles first. Uh, really to underscore uh, 25 principles uh, that you built up on the basis of international law, the UN Charter, treaties. So these are not your inventions. They are the guideposts that actually uh, in, in our better moments, uh, the world's governments have said should guide us. Uh, and uh, have been adopted in many ways uh, in UN General Assembly resolutions or embodied in the UN Charter or part of international uh, legal judgments and so on. One, for example, a uh, very important one that I want to come back to, uh, your point 18, the principle of non-intervention, uh, that uh, it is a duty of uh, countries not to intervene in the internal affairs of other countries, like overthrowing their governments or doing other things to uh, uh, to destabilize other countries. Uh, and as you've uh, already discussed, uh, your point 17, states have a 
positive duty to negotiate. Uh, so when we see a failure of negotiation right now, that's not only bad behavior that leads to war, it's a violation Absolutely. of international law. It's a violation of the responsibility of governments. It's a violation of the international, uh, of the UN charter. So I think these 25 normative points are extremely important. Uh, I'm so happy to hear uh, the praise that uh, former Secretary General M Maria Fernanda Espinoza gave to them. She's wonderful, and, and so her praise is extremely <laughs> important. Uh, but uh, calling them the, the Magna Carta for the international system is, is a wonderful point. Now, uh, Alfred, all through your book, as you elaborate on these points, you raise the questions of obstacles. We are not living in this system. Uh, we are not uh, seeing uh, the U.S. negotiate with Russia, uh, even though we're at a brink of uh, even nuclear war between the countries. We are not seeing uh, Israel negotiate with the Palestinian people, exactly the opposite. There are obstacles everywhere. You have been in this system of trying not only to design what should be done, but actually put it into application. Uh, to use law not only as a, a normative statement of what a, a uh, just world would be, but actually as an instrument to uh, make behavior conform with these principles. So, obstacles. Why are we in the midst of war? Why is the UN system so difficult uh, to uh, actually um, implement and enforce its own charter? Uh, why, to put it in the most uh, dire and awful way, are we even watching a genocide unfold before our eyes? Have UN Security Council resolutions adopted for immediate ceasefires and so on? And yet, uh, it, it, it seems, to put it uh, harshly, like a sideshow to what the real powers do. And so you've been observing this uh, for for many decades, very close up. What can you tell us about these obstacles? Well, we are indeed witnessing a rebellion against the United Nations Charter, a rebellion against international law, and the rebellion is being led by the United States and by NATO countries. It is uh, really... For me as an American, for me as a European, it hurts to see this happen because I want to believe and I want my student to believe in the system. And when the system betrays you, when the system does not do what it must do to save lives, uh, people lose trust in the institutions and we need the institutions. I wrote an article for the American Journal of uh, Economics and Sociology under the title Quis Custodiet Ipsos Custodes, the famous question of Juvenalis in his satires, sixth satire, uh, verses 347 and 348, uh, which is, who will guard over the guardian when the guardians betray you? I mean, only you yourself. You must take the responsibility yourself because the institutions are not doing what they were made to do. Why are they not doing it? Of course, there are tremendous economic interests. Uh, there is a war industry. It's the only people who are making a profit these days. If you have invested in Raytheon or in Lock Lock Lockheed Martin or in Boeing and so on. Uh, so... Um, and, and by the way, incidentally, you may not have seen it, but just in the days in which we're talking, Senator Lindsey Graham, who is one of the crassest politicians in America, 
made a statement uh, that we must continue the war in Ukraine because there are trillions of dollars of mineral resources there <laughs> that otherwise will fall into the hands of the Russians and the Chinese. This is about money. Who will control these resources? Yeah, Rather yeah, shocking thing. statement. It's a thing to say it that clearly. But of yes. course, uh, he's a firebrand. He's always been a firebrand. I know him for the nonsense that comes out of his mouth. So I'm not surprised that Lindsey Graham is capable of saying something that obscene, that vulgar. But I mean, we did the same thing in um, Iraq. We destroyed Iraq because of the oil. We destroyed Libya because of the oil. And we wanted to control. We didn't want to have Saddam Hussein who did his own thing. Or we didn't have uh, Muammar Gaddafi who did his thing. He had to take orders from Washington. And if he didn't, no, we destroy him. And uh, ultimately, it is money. Ultimately, and money, of course, is power. And uh, going back to the obstacles, the major obstacle that I see today uh, is the information war, or rather the disinformation war. I mean, the vast majority of the American people, they're not for war. They don't want any of this. They want better schools. They want better uh, health care. They want better infrastructure and bri bridges that don't fall into the Mississippi. They don't uh, want to spend uh, seven, eight trillion dollars for useless wars. Uh, totally useless. And that money is needed elsewhere. Uh, but if you are subjected to brainwashing nonstop by The New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Wall Street Journal, uh, and of course, all of the smaller uh, newspapers throughout the country pick up their news from Reuters and AP. And I myself had had bad experiences uh, with Reuters, giving interviews uh, to Reuters and then seeing my um, statements, uh, shall we say, doctored. And mm -hmm. um, if that's the only source of information that you have, you are being manipulated badly. And uh, not everybody has the time. I mean, you're married, you have kids. You, you can't be just surfing the internet and trying to hear the real news network or Amy Goodman or uh, Max Blumenthal or Aaron Maté. You don't have the time for that. I do. But uh, the masses don't. So in a democratic uh, system, uh, democracy breaks down, it's dysfunctional because the population uh, has been misinformed and uh, obviously knee-jerk reaction, Putin bad, uh, he bad. You know, we have a culture of hatred, I would even say. We must have an enemy. We must focus all of our hatred against the Russians or against the Chinese or against somebody else, uh, against the Venezuelans, against Maduro, against uh, Diaz Canel, against Daniel Ortega. We must have enemies and people just regurgitate what they hear. As I say, one is freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is meaningless if all that that means is that you can echo whatever nonsense you heard last night in CNN. I mean, freedom of expression presupposes access to all the information, the opportunity to make up your own mind, and then that is the opinion whose expression is protected in Article 19 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And by the way, there again, we are, uh, there's what I call an epistemological trap, and that is already built in the system. Everybody, every professor of human rights tells you that human rights are divided into uh, rights of the first generation, rights of the second generation, rights of the third uh, generation, meaning civil and political, first generation. All those are the only important ones. Uh, economic, social, and cultural. Well, these are secondary rights, maybe someday. And uh, right to peace or right for the environment or something like that. That's, that's just delusional. That is third generation rights. So you see that it's already built in with a prejudice in favor, say, of the right to property, 
uh, the right uh, to control. Whereas um, in Building a Just World Order in the last chapter, I formulate uh, an alternative functional paradigm of human rights. It's very interesting, by the way, I mean, uh, what, what you're saying, and I think uh, some perspective uh, from an American point of view is, is really useful. You say that the U.S. is rebelling against the U.N., and I agree completely. Uh, this is uh, the, the great disaster and great irony of an institution that largely was created by the United Nations, uh, by the United States uh, in uh, uh, by Franklin Roosevelt and by Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, okay. So Franklin Roosevelt conceived the idea of the United Nations already in the middle of World War II, put uh, his uh, team and the international system to work to build a United Nations. So uh, a lot of credit to the U.S. under Roosevelt in 1945 and to Eleanor Roosevelt in 1948 for putting in the fundamental pillars. But now the U.S. does not abide by uh, the U.N. system, does not respect the U.N. General Assembly votes, uses its unilateral veto repeatedly against what is clearly the will of the international system. And you're emphasizing another very uh, important point, which is that under Roosevelt, he had the idea, perhaps unique among American presidents, that economic rights were as core to human rights as political and civil rights. And in 1944, he proposed an economic bill of rights for the American people. This was very radical for a country that was founded on private property and wealth as the uh, highest <laughs> calling, not on fairness and justice. But Roosevelt wanted a to recognize economic rights as fundamental. And what's important for people to understand is if you go back, and I encourage everyone, as you read Alfred Desaias' remarkable book, Building a Just World Order, have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at your side, because the economic rights are not subsidiary, they're absolutely core. They're, they're not something yeah. that comes later or a nice thing to have or a second mention the right to social protection, to education, to health care, to a decent life is, is completely embedded in this. And the U.S. then, even already in the 1960s, rebelled against that idea yeah. by, not, uh, by not adopting the covenant uh, on economic, social, and cultural rights. No, no, it's shocking because after such a great beginning and after the inspiration that went into uh, the creation of the United Nations, uh, the United Nations Charter, and then the uh, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and this fantastic body of uh, legislation that was adopted in those uh, years. Unfortunately, uh, we believe really in exceptionalism that we are essentially above international law. We determine international law. And that is what Anthony Blinken is reminding us with his famous uh, rules-based international order. And uh, I've already said, look, Tony, for heaven's sake, we already have a rules-based international order, and that's the United Nations Charter. Exactly. <laughs> the problem is that you are not observing it. I mean, stick to it. And um, I, 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 there's so many things, there's so many good people in the United States, so many good academics, so many good professors throughout the country. Why is it that you, Jeffrey Sachs, are not our Secretary of State? Why ah, right. <laughs> you know, why don't we have someone with vision? And as I said, my worry, and it's your worry, and we share this uh, uh, admiration uh, for uh, John F. Kennedy, and I think for your listeners, they probably heard it from your mouth many times, but it's so important and it's so acute today 
that I will read from Kennedy's 10 June uh, speech while defending our own vital interests. Nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of a course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. No one has said it better than that. And it just uh, is important. Every student should read that uh, commencement speech of 10 uh, June uh, to uh, 1963, uh, six months before he was murdered. Uh, as the case may be, Pax uh, Optima Rerum, we have, have to do everything for facilitating negotiation in the Ukraine and facilitating negotiation in Gaza. Uh, for that, of course, you need good faith, you need uh, good will, political will, which unfortunately is missing in Washington and is missing uh, in in uh, Israel. Now, I find that uh, disregarding not one, but three orders uh, of the International uh, Court of Justice uh, in uh, the case South Africa against Israel, that is pretty shocking. And disregarding them in total impunity is even more shocking. What can you do uh, against it? I have written to various politicians and ambassadors and said, you know, I cannot do that in the General Assembly, but you can. Uh, you can propose to do what the General Assembly did in 1974, uh, take away the vote from uh, Israel disregard their uh, credentials, adopt the resolution, as in the case of apartheid, that South Africa cannot speak in the General Assembly. That would be such a diplomatic blow against uh, Israel. And then if that's followed up by uh, states uh, terminating their commercial relations uh, with Israel, and I'm not saying uh, two or three states. I'm talking about 50 or 100 states that say, we are witnessing genocide. We will not tolerate this and we will not do business with you. And uh, in, other mean, words, uh, in other words, there are practical things that should follow up after the International Court of Justice has made several rulings and then they are disregarded by Israel. Something I'm, can be done about it. With the complicity of the United States. With the complicity I mean, of the United uh, States. The Geneva International Peace Research Institute. Uh, we presented on the 25th of May, two weeks ago, uh, in The Hague, a uh, legal brief, 29 pages, uh, against Ursula von der Leyen for the crime of complicity. Complicity in providing military economic, political, financial, propagandistic support uh, to Israel and making it, shall we say, palatable, making it plausible uh, that genocide uh, can continue. And uh, this is the first case of complicity being uh, submitted to the ICC, a case of complicity under Article 3E of the Genocide Convention was presented by Nicaragua against um, Germany, and uh, the International Court of Justice copped out, did not issue the order of interim measures of protection that had been requested. I think that the uh, court was wrong in not doing it. Uh, the court had an obligation to issue an order uh, to tell uh, uh, Germany out of the question, you cannot cooperate militarily with uh, uh, Israel, number one. And number two, the weapons that you deliver to Israel before, make sure that those weapons are not used for genocide or you are yourself uh, complicit in, uh, in this genocide. The court didn't say that. The case is still pending, huh? 
of making a decision or on complicity pursuant to Article 3E of the um, uh, Genocide Convention will still be decided upon. But uh, you needed immediate help, and this immediate help uh, was not provided. And, so uh, just to, uh, to, to bring us, uh, um, especially for people listening in, one thing I would like them to, to understand in all of this context is that there's a tremendous amount of machinery of law, the International Court of Justice, the UN Charter, uh, the treaties, uh, and so forth, that give a framework for action. Uh, there is the UN Security Council and its resolutions. But what we are seeing in many cases is uh, not that these institutions uh, don't exist or that uh, countries are abusing gaps in the law, but rather the failure to enforce mechanisms that have been put in place, uh, that are in place, that judgments are made, that ceasefires are demanded, uh, or other kinds of actions demanded to be in compliance with the 1948 Genocide Convention so that Israel stops the mass, mass killings. But these then are not enforced by the, the great powers. And to come back to your, your charter, your Magna Carta for the world, uh, you've explained peace above all, duty to negotiate, uh, the uh, non-interference doctrine that major countries or countries are not to interfere in the internal affairs of uh, other countries, uh, that they are to abide by the spirit of the law that they have set themselves. And you have explained that we are living in a, a period of impunity, perhaps led, I agree with you, by the country that perhaps did most uh, 75 years ago to get things started, the I United think. States. Uh, but now, it, because of its idea of exceptionalism uh, or its unwillingness to be constrained by international law, uh, it runs roughshod over all of this. Now, we are heading to an important summit at the UN yes. in September. We hope it's important. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be a summit of the future, a very unusual meeting called first by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and then supported by the UN General Assembly and now in the midst of negotiation. But the idea is that roughly three quarters of a century since the start of international law under the UN Charter, and roughly three quarters of a century remaining in the 21st century, uh, where are we going with this multilateralism? How do we get it back on track? How do we stop the drift towards complete disaster or collapse of international institutions because of the impunity uh, of one or a few uh, big powers? So, uh, since you are our guide, what is the answer, Alfred? How do we get back on track? And uh, of your charter and your extremely important and cogent uh, recommendations throughout, how would you like to see us proceed to bring all of the major powers back under the authority of international law and to make the UN itself more effective for the balance of this century, the three quarters of the century uh, of the 21st century ahead of us? Well, we need more people like you, Jeff, and we need more people like John Mersheimer and more people like uh, Richard Falk. If you were running uh, the politics uh, of the State Department, we would not be in this mess today. And uh, my concern is, uh, as you said it, the credibility of the institutions, the credibility of uh, international law. We cannot afford to slip down into the so-called law of the jungle. We must have rules that everybody accepts, and the only rules that everybody accepted at one point or another 
was the United Nations Charter. So that remains our world constitution, but a world constitution without enforcement mechanisms. That's where we have to work developing enforcement mechanisms and also expanding and strengthening uh, the international courts and tribunals. I very much believe in the importance of having an inter-American court of human rights, a European court of human rights, an African court of human and people's rights. Uh, it is uh, crucial to channel everything into law. I mean, uh, we have the legislation and uh, countries must come to understand that uh, for local, regional, and international peace, you have to play by the rules. We, however, in the West, uh, have a culture of cheating. I wrote in Counterpunch, uh, <laughs> one of my essays was on the culture of cheating. And that's exactly what we did in Minsk. We wouldn't have the war in, in Ukraine if Angela Merkel from Germany and Francois Hollande from France had entered into this Minsk agreement in good faith, intending to ensure its uh, implementation. Where just to I remind everybody, uh, just a, an interjection, uh, after the coup d'etat in Ukraine in 2014, in which unfortunately the U.S. and Europe participated, uh, perhaps led, uh, and a war broke out in Ukraine already 10 years ago, uh, agreements were reached to end the war, Minsk I and Minsk II. And in particular, the Minsk II agreement was uh, backed by the UN Security Council, and the guarantors were to be France and Germany. <laughs> and Alfred is referring to the fact that not only were they not guarantors, they treated the agreement that they were to guarantee with a kind of cynicism and contempt, we learned afterwards. Even Chancellor Angela Merkel said in an interview after the fact that, oh yes, that was just a holding pattern for Ukraine to gain its military strength. Uh, instead of enforcing a law, it was a kind of prevarication. So this is what you're referring to. Exactly. And that's not the only time that uh, we have uh, cheated. And now put yourself in uh, the position of Putin, or for that matter, any uh, Russian president. Had it been Medvedev, had it been anybody else in, uh, uh, in the Kremlin. Uh, if you enter into a treaty like that, and then you participate during eight long years in all sorts of uh, dialogues, uh, the so-called Normandy format uh, and uh, the OECD and the uh, EU format. There's so many conferences in which uh, Putin participated trying to have implementation of the Minsk agreements. Now, in the end, Putin felt that he had been taken for a ride. And I think in international affairs, it is very, it's very counterproductive uh, to take a major uh, adversary for a ride because he's not going to forgive you. He's actually going to act against your interests. And uh, it was a huge mistake as uh, George F. Kennan uh wrote uh on the 5th of february uh 1997 uh in his uh, famous article in the uh, new york times it's a fatal error it's a fatal miscalculation to have nato expand eastwards contrary to the assurances given by george h w bush and james baker to gorbachev at the time I mean, these in other words, another another part of the culture of cheating. Yeah. And um, to do what you can get away with or think you can get away with. The, the mass of the American people are unaware of that. And when uh, you or Merzheimer or Richard Falk or myself 
say something like that, then uh, we are Putin's puppets. We are disseminating uh, uh, Russian propaganda. For heaven's sake, read it. And uh, read also uh, the uh, treaties that Lavrov, the uh, uh, Russian foreign minister, put on the table uh, in December of 2021, two months before the outbreak uh, of the war. These two treaties between Russia and NATO and Russia and the United States are Could so have avoided all of it. Eminently well grounded on international law, on uh, the United Nations Charter, uh, on principles of um, um, general uh, security for all countries. And uh, the fact that they were dismissed, even with contempt, by uh, Jens Stoltenberg, I mean, he bears a huge responsibility. Uh, for yeah. this war. Let, let me, uh, we were uh, running towards the end of our hour, sad to say, because we could uh, talk about all of these themes uh, for many hours indeed. You have emphasized a duty to negotiate, which we are not fulfilling. You've emphasized the need for enforcement mechanisms, which uh, are plainly still lacking. Uh, you've emphasized and underscored the need for courts uh, and juridical processes to uh, be present uh, and to be venues for uh, enforcement of international law. You've emphasized uh, overcoming the culture of cheating. There's one more recommendation I just want very briefly to discuss, and that's your call early on a decade ago for a UN parliamentary assembly. If you would just say a word about that, I would be grateful. Well, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly uh, is a very good idea. It's been around for more than 40 years, been endorsed by uh, uh, Secretary General Boutros Putros Ghali by many, many very intelligent people. I mean, the idea to have a far more representative uh, assembly, which would not have, at least not at the beginning, would not have... Um, legislative powers, it would be an advisory body that could advise uh, the General Assembly, be parallel to the uh, General Assembly. Uh, I know all the uh, leaders of this movement, and um, I mean, also the world federalists are very much behind uh, this idea of a world parliamentary assembly, or some people call it United Nations parliamentary assembly. But uh, what uh, this idea uh, encompasses is uh, a democratic uh, commitment to listen to people. Because I find myself in the United States totally disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether I vote Democratic or Republican, I am going to get exactly the same thing. I'm going to get a uh, warmonger. I'm going to get someone for the military-industrial complex, someone for Wall Street and not for Main Street, someone uh, who just wants uh, to make the rich richer and forget the mass uh, of the population. I see myself <laughs> maybe voting for Cornell West or voting for uh, Jill Stein. I have yep. quite a bit of sympathy uh, for Jill Stein, and I have a lot of sympathy for Robert F. Kennedy Jr., except that uh, he's not doesn't share my analysis of the problem uh, in Gaza. And, I mean, Gaza didn't start on the 7th of October 2023. Gaza started uh, with the Nakba, with the ethnic cleansing 1948. in 1948. So... The, the assembly would be the place uh, to hear these voices worldwide. I think they would have a much greater hearing. And then we need the media. We need uh, true journalists like uh, Julian Assange. We need uh, uh, journalists who are not going to be uh, the uh, attack dog of the Pentagon or the attack dog of the State Department, 
who are going to be the watchdog of our rights. And uh, by the way, my... Uh, as, as you have said, uh, the, the human right to truth. Uh, as, uh, my uh, yeah, second... Thank you. Countering uh, mainstream narratives. I dedicated it uh, to Julian Assange and to Edward Snowden. And the third book in the trilogy, which came out last year, uh, The Human Rights Industry, I dedicated it to 30 other whistleblowers because I consider whistleblowers uh, to be eminent, really eminent human rights defenders. One more word that I wanted to have because, uh, you know, I'm a practicing Catholic and um, I had several masses read uh, for the soul of uh, Aaron Bushnell. I mean, few things have uh, shocked me, moved me, saddened me as much as seeing a 25-year uh, old man, young man, U.S. airman, uh, self-immolate himself uh, in front of the uh, Israeli embassy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth saying, I know that the pain will be excruciating, uh, but what the Palestinians are suffering is so much worse that this might actually open some people's eyes uh, to the suffering of uh, the Palestinians. Of course, the Israelis have suffered a great deal. And But what we need is an immediate ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire, an end of this just slaughter, and then sit down and try to reach a, uh, uh, a modus vivendi. Uh, I had the privilege of knowing Jimmy Carter, and I love this book of Jimmy Carter, We Can Have Peace in the Holy Land, and I also love this other book of his, uh, if I find it, it's uh, uh, Palestine Peace, uh, Not Apartheid. I mean, peace is possible. Yes, Ooh, uh, and, God, and uh, uh, Alfred, uh, I, I want to say, not only is peace possible, you're, you're opening our eyes uh, on the ways to achieve it, um, we have run out of uh, our our hour, our precious uh, time together. Uh, I think all listeners can know that we we touched on the first book of a trilogy, uh, the first book, Building a Just World Order. It's it's a remarkable book. It's the uh, collection of wisdom of uh, Alfred Desaius uh, in his role as uh, the. UN independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order. Uh, we've heard it described as the Magna Carta for our time uh, of how the international order can function. We are on our way shortly in uh, September 22, 23 to the summit of the future. You have given us uh, crucial uh, ideas for how we can upgrade a system we depend on for our survival, the UN-based system and the UN Charter, the constitution of our time. We're absolutely grateful to you, Alfred Desaius, for all of your uh, ongoing uh, magnificent contributions and for uh, spending the hour with us together on Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. Thanks to everybody for listening in. And uh, again, thank you to Alfred Desaius. Uh, thanks to you, Jeff. <laughs>